In this presentation, we will finish the chapters for this week's reading of the Come Follow Me lessons. This is Romans chapters 4 through 6. Romans 4, the example of Abraham. Romans 4, 1. God was their father, the literal father of their spirits, the adopted father of those who had been born again. But men also have fathers of the flesh. Abraham was th theirs, thus showing that Paul, Paul's present remarks were directed not to Gentiles, but to Jewish converts to Christianity. In Joseph Smith's translation of Romans 4, 2 and 4 through 5, justification is a gift of grace. The Joseph Smith translation of Romans 4, 2 through 5 helps clarify that justification, justification means being innocent, being without blame, is not something we earn, but rather is a gift from God. So here is now the Joseph Smith translation of of Romans 4, 2, 4 through 5. For if Abraham were justified by the law of works, he hath glory in himself, but not of God. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed, and it accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him who is justified by the law of works, is the reward reckoned, not of grace, but of debt. But to him that seeketh not to be justified by the law of works, but believeth on him who justifieth not the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what he is saying is that Abraham the only way to be justified by the law of works is to be perfect in keeping the law, never sinning. And then, therefore, Abraham could glorify in himself and wouldn't need a Savior. But he's saying that's not so. He's saying Abraham knew that he could not keep the law of God perfectly and that he was then therefore justified by a higher power and not the law, which would be Christ. Paul was teaching that if a, ma if a man were justified by the works of the law, then he would have reason to glory, for then the reward he received from the Father would be compensation for service rendered and not a gift of grace. But of course, no man can earn salvation on his own. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles declared that the blessings of the atonement, including inherit, inheriting eternal life, are manifestations of grace. Quoting Elder Holland, neither the unconditional nor the conditional blessings of the atonement are available, except through the grace of Christ. Obviously, the unconditional blessings of the atonement are unearned, but the conditional ones are not fully merited either. By living faithfully and keeping the commandments of God, one can receive additional blessings, but they are still given freely, not technically earned. The Burke of Borman declares emphatically, that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and the mercy and the grace of the Holy Messiah. End of his quote. See, this is the same as, as the King Benjamin says that if we would serve Christ our whole lives, that we would still be unprofitable servants. We would still have need for a Savior because we are all fallen and have the natural man in us. Romans 4, 6 through 12. 6 through 8, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. Verse 9, is this forgiveness reserved only for those who are circumcised? 
Verse 10, no, it came to Abraham before he was circumcised. Verse 11 through 12, and then came circumcision as a token and seal of the faith through which already he had been justified. Such is the promise of God unto Abraham, a promise made without reference to lineage or birth as the literal seed of this man who was the friend of God. The exact words of the divine promises are, And I will bless them through thy name, for as many as receive this gospel, those who receive and are baptized, shall be called after thy name, and shall be accounted thy seed, and shall be raised up and blessed as their father. Since Abraham lived centuries before the law of Moses was given, he was an ideal example of someone who was justified through faith in Christ and not through the law of Moses. The scriptures clearly teach that Abraham was saved and was sanctified and justified long before circumcision of the law of Moses was given, which means it only could have come through Jesus Christ. Quoting from Genesis, Paul noted that Abraham believed, had faith in God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, meaning justification. Abraham received this assurance before he was circumcised. Under the law of Moses, circumcision was the right by which Mount Israelites accepted the responsibilities of the covenant. So it was just an outward symbol to remind them of the covenants they are making, the responsibilities. Thus, Paul was able to show from Scripture that individuals were not justified, meaning made innocent, through obedience to the law of Moses. They were justified through faith in God's promises. Referring to Abraham and also Paul, also allowed Paul to teach what, is, what it means to have faith. For Abraham was strong in faith and was revered by Jews, those of the circumcision, and unbelieving Gentiles, the uncircumcised, as the father of the faithful. Romans 4, 13-14. Verse 13, God's promises thus are to those who have faith ir irrespective of ancestry. Verse 14, if not so, that is, if men were saved because of birth and of particular lineage, the promise would be void, for the promises are that all men who have faith shall be saved and be adopted into the lineage of Abraham. Romans 5, chapter, I'm, I apologize, this is Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Because Israel had the law of Moses, they were favored and blessed above other nations. And yet the law was, in fact, an outpouring of the wrath of God upon those whom he had chosen to be his own particular people. First deity had given them the fullness of his everlasting gospel. The same gospel Paul was now preaching they had been commanded to sanctify themselves that they might behold his face, enter into his rest, and again receive the fullness of glory. Remember the first time Moses goes upon the mount and comes down with the tablets, he has the fullness of the law of the gospel, the Melchizedek priesthood, the rites of the temple, everything. All of that to be exalted were, were on those plates that are those tablets that he had but when he saw them in their riotous and idolatrous condition and worship the calf they were not prepared for this law but they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence therefore the lo the lord in his wrath or in his justice for his anger was kindled against them, took from them the gospel, and gave them instead a lesser law, the law of Moses. 
See, and over the years and through apostasy, the Jews turned the law of Moses into a higher law than what it was. This substitute law, severe and strict in nature, was the law of carnal commandments, which the Lord in his wrath caused to continue with the house of Aaron among the children of Israel until John. Doctrine and Covenants 84, 23-27. It was administered under the Aaronic priesthood, which did not have the, not have the power to save you. It was, as Abinadi expressed it, a very strict law, a law of performances and of ordinances, a law by which they were to observe strictly from day to day to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards them. That's what the law of Moses was for. It was symbolic of Jesus Christ's atonement and keep them in remembrance of that which was to come in the future, the great eternal sacrifice of Christ's atonement. But they had lost the meaning and turned the law of Moses into salvation itself. Romans 4.16, truth, faith leads to action. The Joseph Smith translation of Romans 4.16 reads, Therefore ye are justified of faith and works through grace. This prevents the misreading that faith is merely a passive belief resulting in no changes to one's behavior, loyalty, or character. Meaning just giving lip service. Paul saw faith as a principle of action. The Greek words Paul used for faith, pistis, if I'm saying that right, and to have faith or to leave, pistio, both imply a deep conviction that results in personal commitment and action. The words have connotations like trust, confidence, faithfulness, and obedience. Thus Paul wrote of obedience to the faith, or the obedience that comes from faith, obeying the gospel, and even obedience unto righteousness. In Paul's thinking, those who have faith in Jesus Christ naturally repent, receive the ordinance of baptism, receive the Holy Ghost, and endure in faith. Similarly, Elder, jo Elder Joseph B. Worthen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stated that Without obedience, all have, all we have is a counterfeit, a weak and a watered-down faith. Romans 4, 17 through 22. Abraham's mighty faith was tested and proved in two ways. One, he believed God would give Sarah a son, though he and she were past the normal childbearing age. And two, he believed God would raise Isaac from the dead if need be to fulfill the promise, and Isaac shall all thy seed be called. Jeffrey Alholland encouraged church members to be like Abraham in maintaining hope and trust divine promises. Quoting, to any who may be struggling, I say, hold on, keep trying, God loves you, things will improve, Christ comes to you in his more excellent ministry with a future of better promises. He is your high priest of good things to come. I think of newly called missionaries leaving family and friends to face, on occasion, some rejection and some discouragement, and at least in the beginning, a moment or two of homesickness and perhaps a little fear. I think of your mothers and fathers who are faithfully have their families while still in school or just newly out trying to make ends meet even as they hope to bring even as they hope for a brighter financial future someday I think of those who want to be married in an art those who desire to have children and cannot those who have acquaintances but very few friends those who are grieving over the death of a loved one or are themselves ill with disease I think of those who suffer from sin, their own or someone else's, who need to know there is no way back and that happiness can be restored. I apologize. Who need to know there is a way back 
and that happiness can be restored. I think of the disconsolate and downtrodden who feel life has passed them by and now wish that it could pass them by. To all of these and to so many more, I say, cling to your faith, hold on to your hope, pray always, and be believing. Indeed, as Paul wrote of Abraham, he, against all hope, believed in hope and staggered not, though un through unbelief. He was strong in faith and was fully persuaded what God had promised he was able to perform. Some blessings come soon, some come late, and some don't come until heaven. But for those who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they come. End of Elder Holland's quote. Romans 4, 23-25 Abraham is a pattern for us. If we believe in Christ, he, as he did, it shall be imputed unto us for righteousness as it was unto him. Verse 25, the very atoning sacrifice itself was wrought out by the Son of God so that men might be justified, that is, so that they could do the things which will give them eternal life in the celestial realm. Romans chapter 5, man is justified through the blood of Christ. Salvation and all things instant thereto center in, revolve around, and are found upon the atoning sacrifice of Christ. The blessings of baptism and celestial marriage, the sanctifying power of the Spirit, redemption from temporal and spiritual death, eternal life and exaltation, indeed, all spiritual blessings are living realities because of the atonement. Without that infinite and eternal sacrifice, they would not exist, and the whole plan of salvation would fade away into nothingness and be of no value. Hence, Paul says truly and properly that we are justified by Christ's blood. Strictly, strictly speaking, men are sanctified by the Spirit, and they are justified by the Spirit. But in a larger sense, they are sanctified by the blood, and they are justified by the blood, because the blood of Christ, meaning his atonement wherein he shed his blood, is the foundation upon which all things rest. Thus, by way of accurate exposition, we are justified by the Spirit because of the blood of Christ. Romans 5, 1 through 11, describe the blessings that come to those who are justified by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1, we can have peace with God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 2, by placing our faith, which is doing what God wants, how God wants it done, and when he wants it done, in the Savior, we access, we access we have access to his grace, which is that enabling power, which is not given because of anything we have done to deserve it. As King Benjamin said, I say unto you that if you should serve him who has created you from the beginning and is preserving you from day to day by lending you breath, that you may live and move and do according to your own will and even supporting you from one moment to another, I say if ye should serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. That enables us to overcome the natural man and attain hope. Romans 5.3 We are unable to endure our tribulations, which can help us develop patience. I'm sorry, we are able to endure our tribulations, which can help us develop patience. Romans 5, 4, which endureth in tribulation and all the things shall give the experience and shall be for thy good, producing a hope in Christ. Romans 5, 5, we can obtain a hope make us not ashamed, which means that our hope in Christ promises will not disappoint us. From this verse, we also learn that the love of God is a gift to us through the Holy Ghost. Romans 5, 6-8 
The scripture sometimes describes grace as something we receive from God as a result of what we do. For example, some scriptures teach that our actions can cause us to grow in grace or fall from grace. However, other scriptures describe grace as something we receive from God independent of any action of our own. Romans 5, 6 through 8 is an example of such a scripture. In these verses, Paul taught that Jesus Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, which is a manifestation of God's love for us. The atonement was not something we earned or deserved, but was a free gift given when we were yet without strength or when we were utterly helpless and powerless. Thus, the gift of God's Son is an example of grace as the unmerited favor and assistance God is predisposed to give his children. Grace is not merited. It is freely given to us because of his love. Romans 5, 9 through 10, 15, 17, and 20. We will receive much more a phrase Paul used to show how the grace and blessings of the atonement are more than sufficient to meet our spiritual needs. Romans 5, 6 through 10 teaches that while we were enemies, that we are reconciled, meaning that we have accepted the Savior's atonement and entered into a covenant relationship with Him, we can be much more certain that God will continue to work with us for our salvation. Romans 5, 15, and 17 teaches the fall of Adam brought death into the world and affected all of us, but the atonement of Jesus Christ brought grace into the world with even greater effect. Romans 5.11, we can receive joy through our faith in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Romans 5.12-21, by one man. Joseph Smith said, Nothing in the entire plan of salvation compares in any way in importance with that most transcendent of all events, the atoning sacrifice of the Lord. It is the most important single thing that has ever occurred in the entire history of created things. It is the rock foundation upon which the gospel and all other things rest. Indeed, all things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. Romans 5, 12-21, Paul expounds upon this pivotal foundation of Christ's atonement for mankind. Romans 5.12 Adam brought temporal and spiritual death into the world. The effects of these two deaths then passed upon all mankind. Temporal death is the separation of the body and the spirit when men pass from this sphere of existence. Spiritual death is to die as pertaining to things of righteousness. And this occurs when men arrive at the years of accountability unless they are born again through the baptism of water and the Spirit. Romans 5.13 <coughs> <coughs> Sin did not have its beginning with the law of Moses, but sin, in the sense of violation of that law, was not imputed except to those who had the law. Romans 5.14, the argument here is, how could those who lived during 2,500 years period be redeemed temporally, resurrected, or redeemed spiritually, gain eternal life, if salvation was in the law alone rather than in Christ and his atoning sacrifice? Adam alone transgressed the law by which temporal and spiritual death came into the world, and he alone is accountable therefore. Men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. Hence, Paul explains, other men did not transgress after the similitude of Adam. Adam was a prototype of Christ. The first man, Adam, brought mortality and spiritual death into the world. The last Adam who is Christ, brought immortality and eternal life to men. 
Romans 5.15, even as death passes upon all men because of the fall, so life comes to all through the atonement. And how abundant is God's grace to accomplish such an infinite work. Romans 5.16, one man Adam transgressed and many became sinners. Now one man, now by one man, Christ are many made righteous through the law of justification. Romans 5.17 One thing only comes as a free gift to men, the fact of the atoning sacrifice. All other gifts must be earned. That is, God's gifts are bestowed upon those who live the law, entitling them to receive whatever is involved. The gift of repentance comes to those who turn to the Lord with broken hearts and contrite spirit. The gift of faith is the heavenly endowment conferred upon those who believe in God and live in harmony with his laws. The gifts of the Spirit, all of them, are reserved for those who qualify themselves to receive them. And so it is with the gift of righteousness. It must be merited. Men are a judged and accounted righteous. That is, they are justified. After they keep the commandments, it is then and o- then only that they receive the needed outpouring of God's grace through which they receive the gift of righteousness. So once again, keeping the commandments is how we show our faith. And because of that faith, We can receive grace and become justified through Christ. Romans 5, 18 through 19. Adam's fall brought death, both temporal and spiritual. Christ's atoning sacrifice brought life, both temporal and spiritual. Or in other words, the atonement brought both immortality and eternal life. Romans 5, 20 through 21. Subsequent to Adam's day came the law of... Subsequent to Adam's day came the law of Moses, under which law, death, and sin continued to reign. But now Christ has triumphed over all and has ransomed men from sin and death. From death in that all are raised in immortality, and from sin in that those who forsake evil are raised also unto eternal life. And both of these, both immortality and eternal life, come by the infinite grace of of God. Romans 5.20 teaches that though our sins may abound, the grace of God through the atonement abounds much more, and God's grace is sufficient to help us overcome all our sins and weaknesses. President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles affirmed, save for the, save for the exception of the few who defect to perdition, There is no habit, no addiction, no rebellion, no transgression, no apostasy, no crime exempted from the promises of complete forgiveness. That is the promise of the atonement of Christ. Romans 5.11, the word atonement in the New Testament. Romans 5.11 is the only verse in the King James Version of the New Testament that uses the word atonement. However, a related term, reconciliation, is found in other New Testament passages. Both of these words denote a change from hostile to friendly terms. The reestablishment of an interrupted or broken relationship and the restoration of harmony between parties. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostle defines reconciliation as the process of ransoming man from his state of sin and spiritual darkness and of restoring him to a state of harmony and unity with deity. New Testament authors also use other terms translated as redemption or ransom ransom to refer to the atonement of Jesus Christ. President M. Russell M. Nelson explored the meaning of the word atonement. Ponder the deep meaning of the word atonement. In the English language, the components are at one month. At one meant, suggesting that a person is at one with another. 
Other languages employ words that connote either expediation or reconciliation. Expiation means to atone for. Reconciliation comes from the Latin roots re meaning again, con meaning with, and cella meaning seat. Reconciliation therefore literally means to, to sit again with. Rich meaning is found in the study of the word atonement in the Semitic language of Old Testament times. In Hebrew, the basic word for atonement is kafar, a verb that means to cover or to forgive. Closely related is the Aramaic and Arabic word kafat, meaning a close embrace. I weep for joy when I contemplate the significance of it all. To be redeemed is to be atoned, received in the close embrace of God, with an expression not only of, of his forgiveness, but of our oneness of heart and mind. Romans chapter 6, now verses 1 through 11, the symbolism of baptism. Paul reminded members of the church that they had been baptized into Jesus Christ, thus entering into a covenant relationship with Christ. For church members to choose to continue in sin was incompatible with that covenant relationship. Further, Paul taught that baptism symbolized being buried with Christ and becoming dead unto sin, but alive unto God. Baptism is a rebirth symbolized by coming up, up out of the waters of baptism. Just as we were born into the world and became a living soul, so we must be born again and become a member of God's kingdom. Both births involve the common elements of water, blood, and the spirit. Baptism is not getting a forgiveness of your sins. These children ages 1 through 8 are sinless because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. What sins do they have to wash away? That is not the symbolism of baptism. The symbolism of baptism of here is like burial and the resurrection, being buried and coming forth as a new person, a new man in Christ. L. L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, According to the Apostle Paul, baptism denotes our descent into a watery grave from which we are raised with newness of life in Christ. The ordinance of baptism symbolizes Christ's death and resurrection. We die with him so we can live with him. Romans 6.6 6. Our old man is crucified was symbolized in the law of Moses by animal sacrifice. Just as the animal being sacrificed represented the sacrificial offering of the Savior, it was also to represent us that we would sacrifice and kill the natural man or the old man within us. So when they put that lamb on the altar, they were not only to think about the future atonement of Christ, they were to think about, I need to kill the natural man inside of me like I'm killing this animal and become a new person. In addition, Paul's comparison of baptism to burial indicates that baptisms were performed by immersion, the same way Jesus was baptized. As Robert D. Hells, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that the newness of life that comes with baptism Many members of the church do not fully understand what happened when they went into the waters of baptism. It is very important for us to understand the marvelous gift of the remission of sins. But there is much more. Do you understand and do your children understand that when they are baptized, they are changed forever? When we are baptized, we take upon ourselves the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Taking upon us his name is one of the most significant experiences we have in life. Yet sometimes we pass through that experience with having, without having a full understanding. How many of our children, how many of us, really understand that when we were baptized, we took upon us not only the name of Christ, but also the law of obedience? 
I pray that each of us as members of his kingdom will understand that our baptism and confirmation is the gateway into his kingdom. When we enter, we covenant to be of his kingdom forever. Romans 6, 12-23, Servants to Sin or to Righteousness. Frequently in Paul's writing, the Greek word translated servant also means slave, and Paul used the imagery of slavery to teach about the spiritual consequences of choosing to sin. Since slavery was a common institution in the Roman Empire, Paul's audience would have identified with metaphors like yielding to God as servants would yield to their masters and being slaves to sin. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you did, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.